section. Um, so hopefully that gives you a couple different ideas um, about how to look at it. More of, you know, the literal seven days, the scientific view, the, um, the more Jewish view. So, uh, and we've been talking about the early days. Last week we talked about the dating um, and how... Uh, the events of the Bab of the Tower of Babel and you know the flood and anything like that had to have happened before 10,000 BC. So there's just a few things we need to look at with the Tower of Babel before we go on to the flood. Um, so typically the Tower of Babel was said to be sometime after 5,000 BC, um, as well as the flood was some somewhere after 5,000 BC, which as we've Seen it's probably somewhere after, I mean, sorry, somewhere before 10,000 BC. Um, so as far as why is there no evidence for the Tower of Babel or for the flood, well, that's very easy because, well, I'll come to the, I'll come back to the, to the flood, but for the Tower of Babel because it was made out of mud. You know, mud's not going to last that long. Um, in fact, uh, they typically had to do uh, repairs to buildings on a yearly basis, uh, the ones that were made out of, out of mud. Um, Babel was not Babylon, although it was in the same general area. Now, if you were to look at a, at a map of the Near East, which I forgot to include on here, um, Shinar and Babylon, all that stuff, it's, it's in this area where Babylon would later be, um, but it was not uh, Babylon itself. So the city may be seen as a precursor to Babylon, but it shouldn't be seen as the city of Babylon. Um, it is just as likely the story is a tribal memory as it is an invented myth. To, to assume that the Tower of Babel is myth simply because it shares similarities with um, other other stories or, of, the, of the ancient world is just wrong. You shouldn't ever go to, go to something with the assumption that it's myth, um, especially because, well, once again, tribal, tribal people, they were more um, oral cultures. They didn't have writing. Uh, so they oftentimes had stories that were just handed down and handed down. Um, so until there's sufficient reason to doubt its validity, we shouldn't just hop to the train of um, saying that it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, nothing major is lost in assuming that the Tower, that the, the Tower of Babel was myth, however. If you assume that the Tower of Babel is myth, you don't really lose anything major doctrine. You don't lose anything uh, major about... Um, the main plot of the Bible. You don't really lose anything major about the character of God. Um, I I do believe that it's real, but if you choose not to believe that not to believe that it's real, it's not really going to affect anything major in the Bible. Um, if the tower was before 10,000 BC and accounts for the Stone Age, which is what I suggested, um, which would mean that uh, well, I'll come back to that. Then the flood was much before because the flood was before the Tower of Babel, and like I suggested, the Tower of Babel was probably a long, long time ago. So let's look at that. The flood has oftentimes been discredited as discredited as simply a story that the Jews stole from Babylon and that kind of stuff. But if you compare the different versions, uh, the biblical flood is way different from other versions, as is the creation account. I know people say, oh, well, they just stole the creation account. Well, no, actually, the, there's too many differences to, to warrant that. The, the question becomes... Why are there so many differences, and, and why are, why are they so foundationally different? And it's just things you can't really just skip over. Um, they're too too in depth to, for us to look at, but it is worth mentioning. Um, the flood has been attested by every culture, including the Native Americans, and that's before missionaries came to America. They had a story of a f great flood happening before Christian missionaries came to America. Imagine that for just a second. That would mean that when they came over into into North America, that when they originally migrated into North America, that the people who would become the Native Americans, they already had a story about a great flood happening. Now that's a pretty odd occurrence for something that didn't actually happen for every single culture on the face of the planet to have an account of it happening than to just say, oh, it didn't happen. Based on what? If we're going to go on the assumption that the flood didn't really happen, then we really have to explain why every culture includes it as a story that did happen. Much like we have to come to honest grips about three different cultures and three different places having a tower that could be a afterthought from the Tower of Babel. We looked at Native America, we looked at Egypt, and we looked at Babylon, or Babylon area. Now... This is kind of important, and and, and the other stories, um, it says that the the holy person or, or whatever that he landed on, it was usually um, 
usually somewhere that had religious significance to those people. But in the Bible, it says that Noah landed on Mount Ararat rather than Mount Hermon or Sinai. I want you to get the, get the importance of this. Mount Ararat was not spiritually significant for the Jews. It was in Turkey. Mount Mount Hermon was in Israel. That would have given them like a claim to the land, maybe. Mount Sinai was where they got the law. That would have said, okay, this is a holy mountain, and God's going to later give them. Mount Ararat had no spiritual connection or significance for the Israelites. Why would they have said that Noah landed on that mountain if they were trying to make up a story, their own version of something, to give some kind of spiritual significance? Why wouldn't they have landed him on Mount Sinai, for instance? It just doesn't make sense. Mount Zion would be um, Jerusalem. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's actually a good point, too. He didn't land on Mount, on, uh, on Mount Zion either. Um, okay, so as far as the scope of the flood, people argue back and forth, but the Bible itself says that it was not a global flood. If you turn to Psalm 104, doo -doo 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 -doo, I'm going past it now. Come on now. Psalm 104, starting, I'll start in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heavens like a tent curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers and the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes the, uh, the winds his messenger, flaming fire he, uh, his ministers. He established the earth upon its foundations. Okay, here we're talking about the creation. So that it will not totter forever and ever. You covered it with the, the deep as with the garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. Okay, this is before the, the day when, when, the, when the land came out. Okay, at your rebuke they fled, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down. To the place which you established for them, you set a boundary that they, the water, may not pass over so that they will not return to cover the earth. At creation, God set a border to where the water would never again cover all the land. If the flood covered the whole earth, Psalm is not Psalms 104 is a lie. It's not telling the truth. So either the flood was not global, or the Bible contradicts itself. You can't have it both ways. And why, why, why do people like Ken Ham and stuff keep saying you know, that it they just ignore it and hope it goes away. And I'll look at the other stuff that where it looks like, if you're not familiar with ancient writings, it looks like it's saying that the flood is global in Genesis. But if you understand how they wrote back then, and once again how words can be translated differently, it's it's a completely different ballpark. Now I'll look at that in just a second. But um, there's also the issue that people. People only lived in one area. To have a global flood would be a little bit overkill. Think about it. There's these sinful people in uh, New York. So I'm going to go ahead and flood the whole earth. Okay, I mean, you could do that, but why not just deal with New York? You see what I mean? Like, it's a little bit overkill. Why would God kill every single thing on the face of the entire planet because of some sinful people who were in one area of the earth? That doesn't make sense. But then also there's the issue that it says that when it's when the Bible says whole earth or all the land, it's oftentimes not like we think. Remember I said uh, last week that they weren't as precise of a culture as we are? We're more scientific, precise, everything has to be exact. So when we hear the whole earth, we think the entirety of it. We think of things more literally. Literally, yes, exactly. That's a perfect way of saying it. In our words, we have very specific words for a very specific definition. Well, they really didn't, and oftentimes their words would, would, would share meanings. Like, like, we don't understand it like that. It sounds kind of silly to us because we're more refined, but that doesn't mean that we're more um, advanced. And so when it says the whole earth, we know that it's not, it's not saying every single person because it says Noah found favor with God. But hold on, you just said all people were evil. Well, we know that it doesn't literally mean every single person because it tells us in the next part that Noah found favor with God. And the Bible oftentimes uses terms like this. 
all people. It's a general term meaning the grand majority. You just have to look at the context. Of what right. You right exactly. And this is something that happens all throughout the Bible. It shouldn't alarm us. It sh shouldn't make us feel like the Bible is lying. It shouldn't make us feel like we are not trusting the Bible by not taking it literally. When the Bible wasn't lit written as a literal book. It was not a literal book. You, you shouldn't feel ashamed about that. So when it says that the flood was over the whole earth, um, it can oftentimes – or let me, let me reword that. When it talks about um, the whole earth in the Bible, it can, often, it can mean many different things. One example is uh, people. It can refer to people instead of the land or the things on the land. It can refer specifically to people. It can also refer to an area. Um, and that brings us to an issue that Israel didn't think about the world as globally. They thought about um, the area or the land or stuff like that. They, did, they didn't think in terms of global global things going on. They didn't think in terms of uh, the earth being round. They didn't, they didn't think like that. To try and make them uh, say things in such a way that are modern and scientific, are, it's just not real – historically accurate to think like that um so it says in in um it says in genesis about the water rising up and it says that let me see if i can find it real quick um, okay in verse 14 they're in the ark then the flood came upon the earth, verse 17, for 40 days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Okay, now remember that line, okay? All the high mountains. Okay, now hold on, hold on. Um, the water prevailed 15 cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. Okay, now... There are multiple ways to understand this, and especially if you compare it with the rest of the Bible, um, it becomes – you know, a lot of the air, a lot of the places – a lot of the things in, in, in the Bible that are translated as the whole earth, the mountains, uh, elsewhere in, in the Bible is translated as the area or hills. Yet because we've always heard that the flood was global, we continue to translate this as in global terms – even though in the rest of the Bible, the words usually are not talking about global terms. They're usually talking about local terms. Hills instead of mountains. Area instead of whole earth. You know, whole, whole land maybe would be a, a, better, a better term. So here where it says that it rose 15 cubits, it should be understood as the water rose 15 cubits total. That would mean that the water was 22 feet high. Now, you might think, well, that doesn't sound that high. It's enough for a massive tsunami or something like that, a hurricane maybe, to have come in and flooded the whole plane in there. That's It's enough for that. Um, also, well, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, the cities in the area are from 10,000 or so and after, therefore the flood had to have been before. I already talked about that. Um, now, people say there's no proof of a global flood. Well, that's because you're looking for the wrong evidence in the wrong place. First off, it didn't happen when, when people are saying that it happened. It happened before 10,000 B.C., not after 10,000 B.C. Second off, they're looking for the wrong size. They're looking for a global flood, something that's all the way around the earth, when they should be looking for something that's more more localized to that area, something like well, like a tsunami that would have hit like that. Um, I would think something more global um, than that. Now, that takes us to the word where it says the heavens were opened. Remember I said that the it had rained on the earth before the flood. Now... The Bible oftentimes uses the, the, the floodgates of heaven being opened as a term of there was a great amount of something. So in other words, there was a very strong rainstorm. It doesn't mean that there was no rain beforehand. It just means that at that case, the, the storage of heaven was opened up and it just completely flooded the land. Once again, a lot of this is due to translation errors. A lot of this is due to our modern understanding. Um, We'll ne we will never find a boat to prove the ark I and mean, to prove the flood because I, I want you to think about this. Some a piece of wood from before 10,000 BC. Think about that. Now, obviously, we're not talking about the petrified wood of like Arizona, for instance. We're we're talking about a boat, a 12,000 year old boat minimum, if not older than that. 
which, if it's as old as I think it is, as old as 300,000 years old. Why would a boat still be in existence that long? The oldest boat I think we've found, I believe, is that 2,000 boat from the sea of 2,000 uh, year old boat from, from the Sea of Galilee, and that thing's tiny, tiny. We're talking about a huge piece of wood. Um, so we won't find it on the top of the mountain, and we'll, I'll come back to that for a second. It, Mo, Noah didn't land on top of the mountain. Once again, another mistranslation, which I'll come to that in just a second. Um, and besides that, that's assuming that Noah didn't take it apart and use the wood for something. Why would he have let the wood go to waste? I mean, think about this. So when you hear people saying about, oh, we found Noah's boat. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. That's just that's just silly. Um, and then some people say Israel just stole this story from the neighbors. What about all the other civilizations? Did they all steal it from each other, including the Native Americans? Like, that just doesn't make sense. So a good way of summarizing this would be this picture from uh, Indiana Jones. <laughs> They're digging in the wrong place. <laughs> if you guys have ever seen Indiana Jones. Were you done writing down on that page? I can go back. Okay. So let's look at a few different areas. Um, or a few different points. Okay. There we go. There. Mount Ararat is over 17,000 feet, yet it says that Noah sent a bird out and it got a leaf from an olive tree. Olive trees don't grow over 5,000 feet. So we know that Noah didn't land on top of Mount Ararat. He landed at the base of Mount Ararat. Now that makes a whole lot of more sense because the water only rose 22 feet. So maybe with the with the sweeping of the waves over the land like that, it pushed pushed the boat more towards Mount Ararat. Okay, that's more that's somewhat more reasonable. <clears throat> now it doesn't say that there would be no more floods because that would mean that it was a lie. It says that there's no more floods as judgment for all people. Now, you might say, well, hold on. That area of the world has been flooded since, since then. But never once has the entirety of human life been judged in a flood that threatened to wipe out humanity. Never once has that happened after the flood. That's why when people get and tell you, and tell you all these horror stories about when the polar ice caps melt, how the world's going to get flooded and everybody's going to die off, it's not. no matter how bad it gets, it's not going to be that bad because God promised – that he would never destroy the world by a flood again. So we know that whatever happens with, with global warming or anything like that, people are not going to be wiped out from it. Now, as far as where it says mountains, these words could just as easily be translated as hills. The the flood rose over the hills in the, in the whole area. Now, that, once again, makes more sense, too. Now, the Bible is trying to, trying to establish that something big happened. Yes. And we should understand that and respect that. Something very big is happening, and God was the one who's causing it to happen. However, that shouldn't mean that we have to assume that it's a global flood in order for the emphasis of this passage to be um, captured by us. So as far as why why did God even have Noah take animals on the ark? I mean, that seems like a complete waste of time because it wasn't a global flood, so what's the point? Well, there's a few things. Per first off, the birds would have died. If, if you've ever seen birds in a heavy rainstorm, they don't fly. They land. Well, the water went up 22 feet. All the all the birds would have died. So that is kind of an important point. They need somewhere to roost until the until the storm is over. Second off, there's some indigenous animals that only live in that area. They would have died. Third off, Noah would have been ruined when he got off the ark. He wouldn't have had any any animals to to do anything from, and so he couldn't have had like let's say for instance eggs or you know things like that to live off of until he could get a, get a crop going. He would have died. And then there's the issue that the whole area would have been screwed up. The whole area would have been screwed up. It would have taken maybe even hundreds of years for all the animals to move back in again. That's a big thing. So God saved a lot of hassle by just having Noah take the animals with him, and then they just got back off, and problem solved. See, God was thinking ahead. That doesn't, once again, doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it had to have been global. That just means that God was smarter than the problem. Now, that brings us to another question. Why didn't God just have Noah move out of the area? And then the area would have flooded, and everybody would have been, would have been dead except for Noah. Problem solved, right? Well, no, because the New Testament talks about this. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and him building the boat was a sign for the disbelieving people. God told him that, the, that he would punish all people. Noah built the flood, and they refused to believe, 
even though they saw him building the, building the boat, and then when the flood came, he was rescued while they were destroyed. It was a sign for them. Now, just because God used Noah to um, give the people one last chance to repent, once again, does not mean that it was not a, that it had to have been a global flood. Uh, the ark didn't have to be big enough to hold all animals in the world because it only needed to hold the animals from the area. I personally think that Ken Ham's recreation of the ark is much too big. Um, when it wouldn't have had to be that big, you know, it, it wouldn't have had to fit that many people in it. He fits the, these are all the things that Ken Ham fits in it. He fits dinosaurs in there. He fits birds from the entire face of the planet, and you know, uh, the mammals from the entire face of the planet. I, I really I really think he's overstretching there. As I've suggested, I think the dinosaurs were probably dead before people ever showed up. Now I've suggested that you don't have to take my opinion on that, but either way, my my accounting of the facts actually kind of eases all the main problems that atheists have with the flood account. Well, I'm thinking that if dinosaurs would have existed after the flood, don't you think uh, people that wrote the Bible after the flood would have said something? Would have said something. I do think yeah. that. I do think that very much, Diana. I think that very much. I think you're really onto something. That's exactly what I think. So, okay, here's uh, the uh, Shinar down here, and you can see Babylonia is the area, not just a city. Babylon itself is here. Babylonia is here. Uh, Babylon had a lot of religious significance. And, uh, well, I could go on, but I think that's good enough. And so the land of Shinar, so basically the... Um, the Garden of Eden was somewhere up here or something like that. And they traveled out after they were kicked out of the garden to in this area over here. They built Babel somewhere over in this roundabout area. Um, then a flood came in. Now the flood, once again, could have come in like this. And this land is all pretty flat in here. Could have come in and just flooded this whole area, like the Bible says. And uh, let me see. So Mount Ararat is somewhere up here. It easily could have pushed the boat with the strong waves and landed it over here at the, at the foothills of, of Ararat. That easily could have happened. If you look at this map, it says this stuff is over 1,000 meters, everywhere the orange is. If there were strong waves coming in, like, like for instance, how a tsunami does, you know how it pushes stuff like that. It could have rose the, the boat over the over the the things over here to push it towards the the root. Now, once again, though, people thought in generalized terms. So if it says if it's at the area, of, if it says that it was landed on Mount Ararat, that means a general area. Now that could mean that Ararat was just in sight. That doesn't even have to mean that it was literally at the foothills of Ararat. Once again, they talked in general terms like that. This, once again, should not discourage us from believing the Bible. It should just help us to understand that they thought differently back then, and ancient people wrote differently. Um, so yeah, and then from there, they would have come back down uh, and filled out that way, and that way, and that way, and that way. The three sons of Noah. But that's a topic for another day. Um, so we can easily see the, see the flood going through there. Um, okay, that's, I think that's all we have to look at for today. Any questions about any of this? No? Okay, we will, next week we will finish up talking about the early days, and then the week after that we'll start talking about um, Abraham and the, the Exodus and that kind of stuff, and we'll start being able to get into more tangible evidence of stuff happening. To this point, we've pretty much talked about how, excuse me, how a lack of evidence dis doesn't disprove of any of this stuff. Well, once we get out of this section, we'll be able to start talking about more actual evidence. And uh, I think that'll be a lot funner because we'll start to, you know. Right now we're just talking about hypotheticals, which is fine. But if you like archaeology, you don't want hypotheticals. You want some something with meat on it. So, um, okay, we'll stop there.